glaciers, fjords, and icebergs. Table of contents, glaciers, fjords, and icebergs. Learn all about glaciers, ice fields, ice caps, and icebergs, and the effects of glaciers in producing fjords and other natural wonders. The process by which glaciers grow, move, carve out fjords, and then disappear into the sea will be described. Dr. Sidney Socloff Dr. Sidney22 at gmail.com 2023 Narration by Dr. Sidney Socloff Zoe Phonemes and Nathan Coltove for a complete discussion of YouTube navigation, please go to tiny.one slash yt navigator. Glaciers, fjords, and icebergs. What is a fjord? And why is it spelled that funny way? A fjord or fjord is a steep sided inlet of the sea that has been scoured out by a glacier. The word fjord is of Norwegian origin, and Norway is, of course, known for its many and spectacular fjords. Fjords are prehistoric relics of ancient glacial activity. As a glacier flows through a valley, it cuts into the land and deepens the valley. This often resulted in a steep-sided U-shaped valley. The melting of the glacier leaves behind the glaciated valley. The melting of the glacier leaves behind a glaciated valley. The melting of the glaciers at the end of the ice age resulted in a rise in the sea level. The resulting drowned valley is called a fjord. This is a valley with a glacier in it. If the glacier melts and the sea level rises, this will become a fjord. An excellent example of a U-shaped glaciated valley that is far above sea level and very full. Not a drowned valley is Yosemite Valley in California. When glaciers scoured out these regions, they were above sea level. When the sea level rose, the valleys were drowned by the sea. In some fjords, side streams plunge hundreds of feet over the edge of the fjord. Some of the world's highest waterfalls are of this type. There are many waterfalls in Alaska. This is Kenai Fjord near Seward, Alaska. There are many waterfalls in the fjords of Norway. There are many fjords in Chile. This is Misty Fjords National Monument near Ketchikan in Alaska. Fjord Profile Giant glaciers carved many fjords during the last ice age, some 10 to 20,000 years ago. This is a cross-sectional view of the resulting fjord. Fjords are usually deeper at the upstream end. At the downstream end, there is often a terminal moraine where the glacier deposits debris. If the sea level is lower than the terminal moraine, a landlocked fjord is a result. There are many such examples in Scotland where they are called locks. This is the top view of a lock. There are many places in the world with fjords. They are mostly higher latitude west coast phenomena in areas with coastal mountain ranges. The most notable places are Norway, Alaska, Chile, and New Zealand. Norway has numerous fjords along its west coast. Here is an example of a waterfall in a fjord. Norwegian fjords are noted for their grandeur. Many other examples of fjords are found in Scotland, Greenland, Alaska, British Columbia, Chile, New Zealand, and Antarctica.
a fjord differs from most inlets and bays in the sheer parallel walls, often extending far below the water's surface. Often shallow at the mouth, fjords are frequently very deep farther inland. The longest fjord in Norway is Swangna Fjord. It is 4,000 feet, 1,220 meters, deep and over 100 miles, 160 kilometers, long. This is Songna Fjord. This is Hardanger Fjord in Norway. 179 kilometers long. Here is Norway Fjord in Norway. Scotland has many fjords called friths. And landlocked fjords called lochs. For example, Loch Loman in Scotland. This is Doubtful Sound Fjord in New Zealand. This is a fjord in New Zealand. As you might imagine, Iceland has many fjords mainly on the western and northern coasts. This is a Eyjafjord Thursday in Iceland. Chilean fjords are mainly along the west coast of southern Chile. This is a fjord in Chile. Glaciers What is a glacier? A glacier is basically a very slowly moving river of ice. A glacier is a large mass of ice that occupies a large area of land. A glacier lasts all year long. A glacier is produced by the recrystallization of snow into ice. A glacier shows evidence of past or present flow. Glaciers can be classified into several main groups. 1. Glaciers that extend in continuous sheets on relatively level land and move outward in all directions are called ice sheets. They are called continental glaciers if they are the size of Antarctica or Greenland. Two. Glaciers are called ice caps if they are smaller than the size of Antarctica or Greenland. 3. Glaciers can find within a path that directs the ice movement are called mountain glaciers. Jostadal's brain, in English, Jostadal Glacier, is the largest glacier in continental Europe. A Piedmont glacier is a thick continuous sheet of ice resting on land at the base of a mountain range. Piedmont glaciers are also called expanded foot glaciers. They are formed by the spreading and coalescing of valley glaciers from higher elevations in the mountains. Piedmont glaciers spread out on level ground at the foot of a mountain. Hubbard Glacier is 80 miles or 130 kilometers long and starts in Canada before flowing through Alaska on the way to the sea. 5. Glaciers that spread on the ocean at the edge of ice sheets are called ice shelves. An excellent example of a huge ice shelf is the one that surrounds Antarctica. During the winter, the sea ice around Antarctica extends as far as 1400 miles or 2250 kilometers out into the ocean. This essentially doubles Antarctica in size to make it equal in area to South America. An ice field is a complex of mountain glaciers covering much of a mountain range. How big must a patch of ice be to be considered a glacier? Generally, it is an area of snow and ice that lasts through all seasons of the year and is larger than 0.1 square kilometers or 0.04 square mile. In terms of size, this measures roughly 1,000 feet by 1,000 feet, or 300 meters by 300 meters. 
or about 3 football fields by 3 football fields in extent. During the last ice age, about 1.6 million to 10,000 years ago, almost all of Canada, the northern third of the United States, much of Europe, including all of Scandinavia, and large parts of northern Siberia we covered by ice. At times, glacial ice covered as much as 30% of the world's land area, and at other times the ice cover may have been less than its present extent. Chapter 6 Glaciers in the Americas and Antarctica The world is still emerging from this last ice age. Because of the water frozen in the glaciers, the sea level was much lower during the last ice age. This exposed the Bering Land Bridge connecting Asia to North America. The glaciers in South America are found along the Andes Mountains in southern Argentina and Chile. Amalia Glacier, also known as Skua Glacier, comes from the South Patagonia Ice Field, the second largest in the world. The South Patagonia Ice Field covered all of southern Chile during the last ice age, 10,000 years ago. Two rivers of blue and white ice flow down mountain valleys around Reclus Mountain, a volcano that last erupted in 1908. They converge in a wall almost 2 miles wide and 100 feet high. Amalia Glacier is a tidewater retreating glacier and has retreated about 5 miles or 8 kilometers in the last 50 years. This is Glacier Perito Moreno in Argentina. Today glaciers cover only a tiny fraction of North America. Indeed, only a very small area of Alaska is covered by glaciers. The glaciers in North America are found only at high elevations in mountainous regions. Most of the glaciers in the United States are in Alaska, predominantly in the Panhandle region of southeast Alaska. There are also large glaciers in the Columbia Ice Field in Banff National Park in Canada. There are 616 officially named glaciers in Alaska and about 100,000 unnamed glaciers. Glaciers occur in all parts of the world and at almost all latitudes. Even in Ecuador, Kenya, Uganda and Java, New Guinea. Glaciers even occur at or near the equator although at high altitudes. Here is approximate worldwide area covered by glaciers, in square kilometers. We see that Antarctica and Greenland account for almost all of the glaciers in the world. Surprisingly, Russia, even with its vast expanse of Siberia, does not have many glaciers. That is because of the sparse snowfall in Siberia. Glacier ice today makes up more than 90% of the world's ice and stores about three-fourths of all the fresh water in the world. Glacier ice covers about 11% of the world's land area and would cause a sea level rise of about 300 feet or 90 meters if all existing ice melted. 98% of Antarctica is covered by ice. Here is the Northern Hemisphere Ice Map for July 21, 2005. We see that Greenland is still almost entirely covered with glacial ice, but that very little of Alaska is in midsummer. Greenland is still almost entirely covered by ice. Here is Greenland and Iceland in the middle of July 2004. Note that almost all of Greenland is still covered by ice but that very little of Iceland is. It was called Greenland by the Viking, Leif Erikson, to entice settlers to go from Iceland to Greenland. This was perhaps the greatest real estate scam in history.
The glacial ice in Alaska is mainly confined to the higher elevations in the southeast and the mountains in the north. Note that the interior of Alaska, particularly the north slope, is essentially ice-free in the summertime. Chapter 7 Glaciers and Fjords in Iceland and Norway Is Iceland covered with ice? This is Iceland in midwinter. We see that it is indeed almost all covered with ice or snow. This is Iceland in midsummer. Summer temperatures melt snow and ice on much of Iceland's surface. The lack of uniform snow cover allows the permanent, though shrinking, ice fields and glaciers to show through, particularly Vatnajökull Glacier in the southeast. Iceland has more land covered by glaciers than all of continental Europe. This is a satellite view of Norway in midwinter February. Here is a satellite image showing the glaciers in Norway. Almost all the snow has melted away by midsummer, leaving only these regions covered by snow and ice. This is a map of glaciers in Norway. Chapter 8 Sea Level Rise The world's sea levels are already rising about 0 0.08 inches or 2 millimeters yearly, and scientists believe that melting glaciers and ice sheets on land cause much of this rise. Despite this activity, it is unclear how much sea levels might eventually rise because of melting glaciers. Some scientists believe that if temperatures on Earth were to increase dramatically, the warming of the air would cause more moisture to form in the atmosphere. This would eventually fall as rain and snow, which could balance out any glacial melting. About 99% of the world's glacier ice is in the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets. 91% is in Antarctica alone. Glaciers come from the fall of snow. Snow crystals in the atmosphere are tiny hexagonal plates, needles, stars, or of the intricate shapes. These are snowflakes. In a deposited snowpack, these intricate shapes are usually unstable. Molecules tend to evaporate off the sharp, high curvature points of crystals and condense into hollows in the ice grains. This causes a general rounding of the tiny ice grains so that they fit more closely together in addition. The wind may break off the points of the intricate crystals and thus pack them more tightly. As the snowpack accumulates, the weight causes the snowflakes to pack closer and closer together. Under heavy pressure, the snowflakes recrystallize into an aggregate of irregularly shaped, interlocking single crystals ranging from a few millimeters to several tens of centimeters. Chapter 10 Glaciers, Gain and Loss Accumulation refers to all processes that contribute mass to a glacier. Snowfall is predominant. Glaciers are nourished mainly by snowfall. Glaciers waste away by melting and run off or by the breaking off of icebergs, called calving. For a glacier to remain at a constant size, there must be a balance between income, accumulation, and outgo, ablation. The glacier will grow if this balance is positive more gain than loss. If this balance is negative, the glacier will shrink. Whereas ice sheets predominate in Greenland and Antarctica, mountain glaciers are most important in Alaska and South America. Mountain glaciers are generally confined to the path directing their movement. Chapter 11 The Hydrologic Cycle the ocean waters are warmed by the sun. Water evaporates from the ocean. 
As the water vapor rises in the atmosphere, it cools and condenses into tiny water droplets, which form clouds. Under the influence of onshore winds, the clouds of West Higa up the slopes of the coastal mountain ranges. This is known as orographic uplift. As the clouds rise Higa, the water droplets condense, form snowflakes and fall as snow. The snowfall at higher elevations accumulates throughout the year. Snowfall exceeds the amount lost by melting or evaporation at these elevations. As the snowpack gets thicker, the snowflakes get compressed, turn into ice, and form a glacier. As the ice gets thicker, it starts to flow slowly downward. At lower elevations, the ice melts or forms an ice shelf and breaks into icebergs. Here is a cross-sectional view of a mountain glacier. Tidewater glaciers terminate in the ocean by breaking off or calving icebergs. These ice shelves, or floating ice at the terminus of the glacier, are extensions of ice sheets originating in mountain glaciers or other ice types of ice fields. Only the glaciers in Antarctica and Greenland have floating termini. Although it is less well known and visited than Glacier Bay, some claim Sawyer Glacier is even more spectacular. Indeed, some say that it is the bluest and most beautiful glacier in Alaska. There is a glacier on a mountain slope. The thick glacier ice acts as an insulating blanket between the cold mountain air and the mountain cider base of the glacier. Geothermal heat from the Earth's core warms the underside of the glacier. The combination of heat and intense pressure produces the melting of the glacial ice at the underside or base of the glacier. This produces a thin layer of meltwater. Another source of meltwater is pressure melting. As the pressure increases, the melting point of ice decreases from 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 0 degrees Celsius to lower temperatures. Hence, the tremendous weight of the ice in a glacier causes a decrease in the melting temperature at the bottom of the glacier. The meltwater is a lubricating layer that allows the glacier to slide slowly down the mountainside. This mechanism of glacier flow is responsible for the rapid flow of glaciers or glacial surges that are sometimes observed. Another way in which glaciers move is by the very slow creep, oozing, or plastic deformation of the ice. Once a mass of compressed ice reaches a critical thickness, around 60 feet or 18 meters thick. It becomes so heavy that it begins to deform and move very slowly. Movement along the underside of a glacier is slower than movement at the top due to the friction created as it slides along the ground's surface. The movement of the glacial ice, deformed under its own weight, is a flow similar to that observed in plastics and viscous liquids. This is analogous to the flow of a very thick liquid like molasses or ketchup. This is more likely how glaciers move when the base is very rough or there is very little meltwater. As the glacier moves down through a valley, the center of the glacier moves faster than the outer edges. Typically, Glaciers move at speeds ranging from a few inches or several centimeters a day to several feet or as much as a meter per day. Since the speed is so slow, we might more appropriately talk in terms of movement per year. This is anywhere from about 100. Thus, for a glacier that is some 50 miles long, it would take anywhere from about 200 years to as long as 2,000 years for ice to flow the entire length of the glacier.
When a glacier moves rapidly by the plastic deformation of the ice, internal stresses build up in the ice, which cannot be relieved by deformation alone, and cracks, called crevasses, form at the surface of the glacier. This shows the flow of a glacier in terms of the plastic deformation and the sliding along the base or ground, known as basal slip. Here is a cross-sectional view of a mountain glacier. The thickness of a glacier is typically about one half of the surface width. Although few glaciers have been measured, the measured thicknesses range from a few tens of meters for small glaciers to about 1,500 meters or about one mile for the largest glaciers in Alaska. The ice in Antarctica is several kilometers thick. Glaciers have existed in the mountains ever since the Ice Age. But glacier flow moves the snow and ice through the entire length of the glacier in 100 years or less. So, most of the glacier ice in Alaska is less than 100 years old. Therefore, most glacier ice is not left over from the Ice Age. However, there is really old ice near the bottoms of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. Most of the glacier ice is only a few tenths of a degree below the melting temperature, except for a surface layer a few meters thick that is cooled during winter. As a consequence, most glaciers are not frozen to their beds. These glaciers are referred to as temperate glaciers. Glaciologists refer to a glacier as a cold glacier if it is more than a few degrees below the freezing temperature throughout most of its thickness. Below the snow line, water resulting from the melting of snow and ice, referred to as meltwater, tunnels within the glacier down to its base. Streams of meltwater also flow on the ground along the lateral margins of some valley glaciers. When the meltwaters reach the lower end of the glacier, they may form a lake or combine into a stream flowing to the sea. Rock flour, also known as glacier flour, is finely pulverized rock produced by glacial milling. The sliding of a glacier along the ground, as it carries along hard rock debris, produces a grinding or milling effect. Similar to two millstones grinding wheat into flour, this glacial milling produces very fine silt carried along in suspension in the meltwater. As the meltwater flows along, it carries the rock flour in suspension. Note the rock flour in this picture. This is rock flour in the Beagle Channel. Note the rock flower in this picture as well. Moraines Glaciers erode the rock underneath them. A glacier can carve a valley, wearing away rocks and soil through abrasion, and plucking up and moving large pieces of rock and debris. The glacier pushes this earth and rock forward as it advances almost like a conveyor belt, and dumps it to the side along the way or at the end of the glacier. An end or terminal moraine is formed at the forward end of a retreating glacier. This shows the formation of an end moraine from a retreating glacier. Examples of this are the moraines, where the rock and debris are deposited at the end and along the sides of the glacier. Lateral moraines are deposited along the edges of a valley in ridges. Terminal moraines are ridges deposited along the outer edge of a glacier at the position of farthest advance. Recessional moraines mark points where the glacier front was temporarily stabilized. Lateral moraines are deposited along the edges of a valley in ridges. Terminal moraines are ridges deposited along the outer edge of a glacier at the position of farthest advance.
recessional moraines marked points where the glacier front was temporarily stabilized. Here is a diagram of recessional and terminal end moraines. Medial moraines are formed where two glaciers meet, and their lateral moraines coalesce. Here are some lateral and medial moraines, showing up as long dark bends of debris visible on top and along the edges of these glaciers. Here are lateral and medial moraines. Recessional moraines mark points where the glacier front temporarily stopped and stabilized. A glacier in retreat leaves behind an end or terminal moraine. Here is a valley in a landscape before glaciation or preglacial. This is the valley after glaciation. Here is a cirque glacier. This is a horn formed by glacial action. This is the U-shaped valley that results after the glacier is gone. Halo hanging valleys and waterfalls. This is called a glacial erratic. These are strings of lakes. Glacial retreat occurs when melting or calving removes ice more quickly than glacier flow replenishes it. When a glacier retreats, the ice does not flow back up the valley. Like water, ice flows downhill and navel goes back up the valley. An analogous situation is that of a melting icicle. As the icicle melts, it gets shorter. But the ice is not actually moving back upward. Instead, it turns into water flowing or dripping downward. This is a retreating glacier and terminal moraine. Below the snow line, water resulting from the melting of snow and ice, referred to as melt water, tunnels within the glacier down to its base. Streams of melt water also flow on the ground along the lateral margins of some valley glaciers. When the melt waters reach the lower end of the glacier, they may form a lake or combine into a stream flowing to the sea. Many land surfaces at high elevations have been repeatedly modified by glacial action throughout the history of the Earth. Surface change caused by glacial action is called glaciation, and a region that exhibits it is said to have been glaciated. There is a glaciated landscape with a variety of landform features such as a recessional moraine, kettle lakes, and carns. Glacial abrasion is grooves and scratches in rocks produced by glacier flow. During the Ice Age, the North American ice sheet extended into the northern part of the present United States. It gouged out depressions that became the Great Lakes. Many rolling hills in the states below the Great Lakes are terminal and recessional moraines. One of the most numerous and familiar types of glaciers is Cirque glaciers. They frequently occupy deep, steep walled half bow like recesses or hollows that are situated high on the side of a mountain. The very small glaciers that occupy cirques are also commonly called glacierets, niche glaciers, or quarry glaciers. Mendenhall Glacier In southeast Alaska, the maritime climate and coastal mountains create favorable conditions for glaciation. Moist air flows toward the mountains, rises and releases snow and rain. The annual snowfall on the Juneau Ice Field exceeds 100 feet or 30 meters. 
Mendenhall Glacier is one of the 38 large glaciers that flow from the 1500 square mile, 4000 square kilometers expanse of rock, snow and ice known as the Juno Ice Field. As glacial ice continues to build, gravity pulls the ice down the slope. The glacier slowly scours the bedrock and grinds down its 13 mile, 21 kilometers, journey to Mendenhall Lake. The ice field snowfall perpetually creates new glacial ice for Mendenhall Glacier, which takes 200 to 250 years to travel from the Juneau Ice Field to Mendenhall Lake. In 1892, the Mendenhall Glacier was named to honor Thomas Corwin Mendenhall. 1841 to 1924, who served as superintendent of the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey from 1889 to 1894. A noted scientist, Mendenhall also served on the Alaska Boundary Commission, responsible for surveying the international boundary between Canada and Alaska. This is the Mendenhall Glacier. This is the Mendenhall Glacier. This is the Mendenhall Glacier. This is a map of the Mendenhall Glacier and Visitor Center. This is the The Rainbow Glacier near Haines is an example of a hanging glacier. Columbia Glacier is an example of a tidewater glacier. This is the Columbia Glacier Ice Shelf. Hubbard Glacier Hubbard Glacier This is Southeast Alaska and the Yukon Territory of Canada. This is Southeast Alaska and the Yukon Territory of Canada. This is Southeast Alaska in the Yukon Territory of Canada. This is Southeast Alaska. The Hubbard Glacier is a tidewater glacier in Alaska and the Yukon Territory of Canada. It is the longest tidewater glacier in Alaska, with an open calving face of 10 kilometers 6 miles wide. The Hubbard Glacier is a tidewater glacier in Alaska in the Yukon Territory of Canada. It is the longest tidewater glacier in Alaska, with an open calving face over 10 kilometers, 6 mi, wide. This is a map of Disenchantment Bay, Russell Fjord, and Hubbard Glacier. This is a satellite view of Disenchantment Bay, Russell Fjord and Hubbard Glacier. This is a satellite view of Disenchantment Bay, Russell Fjord, and Hubbard Glacier. Hubbard Glacier's longest source, 122 kilometers from its snout, is about 11,000 feet above the sea. Before it reaches the sea, Hubbard is joined by the Valerie Glacier to the west. Through forward surges of its own ice, it has contributed to the advance of the ice flow that experts believe will eventually dam the Russell Fjord from disenchantment bay waters. Hubbard Glacier is the largest tidewater glacier on the North American continent. It has been thickening and advancing toward the Gulf of Alaska since it was first mapped by the International Boundary Commission in 1895. This starkly contrasts with most glaciers, which have thinned and retreated during the last century. This atypical behavior is an important example of the calving glacier cycle in which glacier advance and retreat are controlled more by the mechanics of terminus calving than by climate fluctuations. This is Hubbard Glacier from Disenchantment Bay on a very foggy day. This shows a medial moraine in the Hubbard Glacier. 
These are the terminus positions of Hubbard Glacier in 1895, 1948, 1988, and 2001 showing advances over during the last 106 years. The Hubbard Glacier on June 13, 1986. Showing Glacier Dam blocking Russell Fjord. This is a view west from Russell Fjord over the north end of Disenchantment Bay with the Wrangell St. Elias Mountains and Turner Glacier in the background. If Hubbard Glacier continues to advance, it will close the seaward entrance of Russell Fjord and create the largest glacier dammed lake on the North American continent in historic times. This is Hubbard Glacier during the Russell Fjord closure in 1986. The Hubbard Glacier ice margin has continued to advance for about a century. In May 1986, the Hubbard Glacier surged forward, blocking the outlet of Russell Fjord and creating Russell Lake. All that summer, the new lake was filled with runoff. Its water level rose 25 meters, and the decrease in salinity threatened its sea life. The fjord could become dammed again, and perhaps permanently. If this happens, the bay could overflow its southern banks and drain through the Setuk River instead, threatening trout habitat and a local airport. This is the Hubbard Glacier in icebergs formed by calving. The ice at the foot of the Hubbard Glacier is about 400 years old. It takes that long for ice to traverse the length of the glacier. The glacier routinely calves off icebergs the size of a 10-story building. Most of the glacier is below the water line, and newly calved icebergs can shoot up quite dramatically. So ships must keep their distance from it as they ply their way up and down the coast. We will next have a short video clip on the calving of the Hubbard Glacier. This is the Hubbard Glacier. This is the Hubbard Glacier. This is an iceberg from the Hubbard Glacier. This is 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 calving from the Hubbard Glacier. Icebergs form when ice from large glaciers flows into the ocean and breaks into floating blocks. Most icebergs form in Alaska, Greenland, and Antarctica. Icebergs can be enormous, especially around Antarctica and the North Atlantic Ocean. They can be taller than the Statue of Liberty and as big as a small state. Usually, only a tiny part of an iceberg can be seen from the surface of the water. Thousands of these massive glacial chunks are formed each year, and many are carried hundreds of miles by ocean currents until they gradually melt away. The Titanic's tragic collision with an iceberg in 1912 shows how dangerous icebergs can be. The Titanic was such a massive vessel that passengers barely felt the impact as the iceberg gripped a gaping hole in the bottom of the ship. The Titanic sank on its first voyage, but the glacial ice that doomed the unsinkable ship may have been more than 15,000 years old.
Now satellites carefully track these colossal ice cubes and create detailed charts to warn navigators about their constantly shifting locations. While icebergs float in frigid saltwater oceans, they are actually made of fresh water. Each year, enough new icebergs are formed in Antarctica to supply fresh water to the world's 8 billion inhabitants and every industry on our planet for four months. On average, icebergs drift at about 0.4 miles per hour, 0.7 kilometers per hour. The speed at which icebergs move is affected by many things, including their size and shape, ocean currents, waves and wind. It takes icebergs about 100 days to travel 1,000 miles or 1,600 kilometers. Why don't icebergs melt fast, eh? An ice cube in a glass of water usually melts in less than an who? Why do icebergs last days, weeks, or even months? This is an ice cube in water. The ice cube will begin in about one hour. This is an iceberg in water. The iceberg will be gone in about 10,000 hours, or about 100 days. It's the huge size of the iceberg that makes it last so very much longer than an ice cube. Why do icebergs float? Icebergs float because they are made of ice and snow, which are both less dense than water. The surface of the iceberg consists mainly of snow, which is not very compact. This portion of the iceberg remains above the waterline. Icebergs barely float because ice is just slightly less dense than water. About 90% of an iceberg's volume lies below the surface of the water, so its size can be very deceiving. The very compact ice core is relatively heavier and keeps much of the iceberg underwater. The light snow layers are compacted when an iceberg tumbles over several times. Thus, even more of the iceberg becomes submerged underwater. This shows the crystalline structure of ice. Every oxygen atom is surrounded equally in three-dimensional space with three oxygen nearest neighbors. Every oxygen atom shares a hydrogen atom with its closest neighbor. The basic six-fold or hexagonal symmetry of the crystal structure of ice results in the corresponding six-fold or hexagonal symmetry of snowflakes. It would look like this in two-dimensional space. The hydrogen atoms lose their electrons to the oxygen atoms. We obtain this solid crystalline structure for ice in two-dimensional space. The hydrogen atoms lose their electrons to the oxygen atoms and become just positively charged protons. The oxygen atoms become negatively charged, and this attraction between the negatively charged oxygen and the positively charged hydrogen is the glue that keeps the structure together as a solid. Note that there are twice as many hydrogen atoms as oxygen by the chemical formula for water. H2O. In contrast, liquid water is just a jumble of the H2O molecules moving about with no regular arrangement. This results in water having a heat density than ice. The ice crystal structure is relatively open, with a density of about 10% less than water. As a result, ice floats on water and about 8-9 of an iceberg is below the water level. Here's another view of the three-dimensional crystal structure of ice. There is a basic six-fold or hexagonal symmetry inherent in this structure. The density of the snowpack generally increases with time from an initial low value of 3 to 15 pounds per cubic foot, 50 to 250 kilograms per cubic meter. 
with time the density increases, approaching that of pure ice, which is 55 pounds per cubic foot, 917 kilograms per cubic meter at 0 degrees Celsius and atmospheric pressure. In comparison, the density of water is 62 pounds and 40 pence per cubic foot. As a result, icebergs float on water, with about 90% being below the water level. Why do icebergs look blue? Why does glacial ice often appear blue? Ice within an iceberg is a sky blue color because it only absorbs a small portion of red light that enters it. Thus, it is tinted rather than perfectly clear. Glacial ice appears blue when it has become very dense. Years of compression gradually make the ice denser over time, forcing out the tiny air pockets between crystals. When glacier ice becomes extremely dense, the ice absorbs the longer wavelength light at the red end of the spectrum and reflects primarily blue, which is what we see. When glacier ice is white, that usually means that there are many tiny air bubbles still in the ice. The longer the path light travels in ice, the more the longer wavelength light at the red end of the spectrum is absorbed and the bluer it appears. On the other hand, snow appears white by reflected light because of the reflections from the individual snowflakes. Thus, the surface of a snow-covered glacier will appear white. Icebergs come in all sizes. Brash ice ranges from the size of ice cubes to baseballs. Bergy bits refer to icebergs larger than baseballs and smaller than beach balls. Icebergs between 1 and 3 meters are called growlers because sailors often hear a growling sound as these icebergs bob in the water. Norga icebergs are simply called bergs. The largest of all is called tabula bergs. These are plates of ice up to 1,000 meters thick. Some are the size of a small state, such as Rhode Island or Delaware. Chapter 20 Iceberg Calving In the Northern Hemisphere, about 10,000 icebergs are produced yearly from the West Greenland glaciers. An average of 375 of these icebergs flow south of Newfoundland into the North Atlantic shipping lanes, where they are a hazard to navigation. Ice shelves are more common in Antarctica and in the North Atlantic region of West Greenland. Icebergs that break off from ice shelves can be exceptionally large. As was mentioned previously, all the calving glaciers in Alaska fill their fjords completely to the bed. This is a calving glacier in Alaska. The icebergs tend to fall off in chunks, producing smaller icebergs than these produced in the North Atlantic region or Antarctica. These are small icebergs. Ships usually do not get closer than one quarter mile or 400 meters from a glacier because the glacier often calves exceptionally large icebergs, sometimes the size of a house. These are icebergs. These are more icebergs. Icesizzle. An iceberg has tiny pockets or bubbles of air under tremendous pressure. As the iceberg melts, the air bubbles become released, producing a popping sound or sizzling sound. Here we have a melting iceberg. When the air bubbles are released, a sound is produced known as ice sizzle. Recommended videos, glaciers, fjords, and icebergs. Recommended video.
Climate 101, Glaciers, National Geographic. Recommended video, How do glaciers shape the landscape? Recommended video, What are glaciers? Recommended video, BBC Geography, Glaciers. Recommended video, YouTube navigation. Table of contents, glaciers, fjords, and icebergs. Thanks for watching. Please watch some more of my great videos.